You're going to have to work for it when you do it your way. You're going to have to, you're going to, you're going to, your provision is now on you when you get out of the will of God. And it was never God's intention for you to carry the weight of your own provision. It was never God's intention for you to carry the weight of your own provision. But when man became disobedient, that put all of us under curse. He put each and every one of us under the curse. And when he did that, that's why you got to sweat for your own provision. That's why the world is in the situation that it's in now because of disobedience. But thank God for Galatians 3 that says we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. Amen. Now you have been redeemed from the curse of the law. So, this, one, this is going to set you free. So, if you are still trying to make provision and you toiling for it and you doing it your way, you are under the curse. You are under the curse. Because God, Jesus came and redeemed us from the curse. Yeah. Now we still have to do our part because Adam did. Now we've heard that, we, we, I used to joke and say this when I was a kid and say things like, man, when I get to heaven, I'm going to talk to Adam. I'm going I'm to punch him in the throat. I said, because... We working, we doing all this stuff. We wouldn't have had to do it. But the reality is, Scripture says that it was no man to tend to the ground. So God created Adam to tend to the ground. So Adam had a job. He had to work. Our toil just didn't come with it. God said, hey, you do this. I have provided everything that you need. Provision is never a problem. It was never a problem until disobedience entered into man. Now consequences have to come about. And some of us are still operating under the curse when we have been redeemed from the curse. Some of us are still operating under that. So I hope you receive that, that it was never God's intention for you to work for your own provision, to carry the weight of your own provision, to have the words of your own provision. That's why 1 Peter 5 and 7 says, he says, hey, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. He says, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. Matthew 11 says, hey, he says, hey, those who are heavy burdened, he says, take on my yoke because it's light. He says, I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. Now again, we have to do our part, but God is saying, hey, you don't worry about all those things. As long as you stay in my will, in my grace flow, provision is there. Provision is there. Provision is there. Whatever you need, it's something about obedience. Obedience unlocks the door to everything you need. And even some of your desires. That's what obedience does. It's some, I've shared this with you before. And as you search throughout scripture, every commandment or every act of obedience that God gives, blessings follow. Yes. A blessing follow. Yes. A blessing follow. We talk about Deuteronomy 28 a lot. God says, hey, if you hearken diligently unto my voice, 
these blessings will overtake you. He says, you'll be going, you'll be blessed when you're going, you'll be blessed when you're coming, you'll be the lender and not the borrower, you'll be the head and not the not the, the knee. All these blessings, he says, you'll be blessed in the field. All these blessings will overtake you if you will just do this. Yeah. If you will just do this. So that's all that Adam had to do was just continue to be obedient. But thank God we have been redeemed from that curse. And so now we have the ability as long as we're obedient. Yeah. You, you, we, we can just be, here, here's, here, here's the key. we can just be obedient and not even look for blessing. But because God can never go back on his word. Yes, yes. Blessings have to fall. Yes. They have to fall. Yes, Lord. They have to fall. Because God cannot lie. Yes, he can't lie. He can't lie. That's one thing he can't do. So as long, no matter, like the man of God said, he came up. And if we continue to move forward in what he has called us to do, no matter what it looks like, you might be broke, busted, and disgusted when, when God gives you that promise. But if you move forward, this, this is how it works. This is how faith works. Faith is an action. Faith is an action word. Right? It's an action word. So, as I said, you can, you can have nothing from the beginning. You can be broke, busted, and disgusted. And when God gives you a promise, and as you begin to move forward in, promise, in the promise, Grace is already there waiting on you. Yeah. Provision is already there waiting on you. Everything that you need to complete what God has ordained you to do is waiting on you as you move forward. As you move forward. But as long as you stay stagnant, the blessings are still there waiting on you. But you just got to move forward into it. You got to move forward to it. That's like water. I was reminded of water. Y'all know how water is. If water sits at a certain place for a, 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 a amount of time, what happens to it? It begins to stink. But as long as water is flowing, life is in it. Life is in it. Life is in it. Life is in it. As I was studying, I was I was I was thinking about that. You know why the, the Dead Sea y'all the Dead Sea y'all have heard of the Dead Sea. Y'all know why they call it the Dead, the Dead Sea? Because if water flows into the Dead Sea, but it doesn't release it anywhere. And so Life flows into it. long as you're obedient and moving forward in what he's called you to do, provision is waiting on you. Yes. Blessings are waiting on you. Yes. Provision is waiting on you. We've been talking the last few weeks about keeping the main thing the main thing and staying focused. As the prophetess got up here, she was 
share the, with the word, share the word of God. That's one of the things that she talked about was stay in focus. Faint not in what you're doing. Because if you stay focused on what God has called you to do, if you stay focused on God, no matter what it looks like, troubles, challenges, oh, they'll come, they still will come. Those are those distractions that she talked about. Oh, they'll come, they coming. But as long as you stay focused, Peter says this, Peter says, after you have suffered for a while, signifying that it will be challenges, it will be troubles, no matter what. He says, after you have suffered for a little while, the, the God of all grace will sustain you. So we've been talking about staying focused, keeping the main thing the main thing. And I want to quickly talk to you about math, uh, from Matthew 6 today. Very quickly, I just want to share this. Because uh, the Lord has already spoken. The Lord has already showed up and showed out. And I hope that, I pray that you have got what you came here for. I, 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 I believe, and I pray that you have an expectancy. And, I, and if you have an expectancy, I know that God met it. Because you can't come in an atmosphere like today and not receive something yes. that I know. So Matthew 6, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with this chapter. Matthew 6, I want to read 19 through 33. It says... I'm sorry, uh, 24. Matthew 24. Through 33. And it starts out saying, it says, and I'm reading from the King James Version, it says, no man can serve two masters. It says, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. It says, you cannot serve God and mammon. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to deal with that. You know what it mammon represents? Money, uh, material things, wealth. Verse 25 says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you should eat or what you should drink, nor yet for your body and what you should put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment being clothed? He says, verse 26 says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow, they neither sow, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feed them. Are you not much better than they? Verse 27. He says, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit into his statue? Statue. 28. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Verse 29 says, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 30. Wherefore, if you so clothe the grass, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, which today is, and tomorrow is cast unto the oven, shall you not, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Verse 31 it says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What you, what we what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or where will the, shall we be clothed? Verse 32 it says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Yes. It says, For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Verse 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Verse 34, the last verse, he says, Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Quick overview right quick. Now we know that Matthew 6 uh, is in the middle of one of the most powerful sermons that they say Jesus ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, which starts in verse in, in chapter 5 and it goes through uh, chapter 7. So this is this is 
right in the middle of the theologians say is the most powerful sermon that Jesus has ever preached. Matthew 5, it talks about the Beatitudes, and we know that the Beatitudes is simply what it says, attitude. And it, it's the character of the king, of character of the kingdom of heaven. The Beatitude also means blessed. In the Beatitude, it talks about eight, well, nine blessings. It talks about nine blessings. It starts out with talking, it starts out saying it gives a condition and then it gives a result. It gives a condition and then it gives a result. Here's an example. Verse 3 says, Matthew 5, verse 3 says, it says, the condition is blessed are the poor in spirit. The result is for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4 says, the condition is blessed are they that mourn. The, the result is for there shall be comforted. Verse 5, the condition is blessed are, are it says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth is the result. And so forth. Matthew 5 also talks about one of, one of the things that I love to talk about a lot right here. Matthew 5, 13 talks about salt and light. Salt and light. We talk about salt and light a lot. And when the prophet was, was, was talking about uh, the vehicles, the new vehicles, it was reminding me of that salt and light that Matthew 5 talks about. It was talking about a light that's high on a hill that cannot be hid. Talks about the light that's high on a hill that cannot be hid. Now we're not, I'm not, this is not a prosperity message right here, but I do believe that God want that those type of lights to shine. Because yeah. he does want the world to see how he blesses his people. Yeah. He wants the world to see that. We just gotta make sure that we stay in a humble position when God does exalt us to that place and gives us those type things. That's the light that he's talking about. Well, one representation of the light that he's talking about. I gave you the illustration of light. We talk about the light. I gave you the illustration of the lighthouse and what a lighthouse does. A lighthouse does two things. The lighthouse, it, 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 it guides the ships in and gives them a, a, a safe harbor. So it guides them unto safety. The second thing that it does is it steers them away from danger. It stirs them away from danger. That's why Jesus says, you know, he's the light of the world. Yes. Because he wants to steer you away from danger. And that danger is the eternal damnation of your soul. Yes. Matthew 6, it talks about doing good works. You know, he talks about, hey, you know, when you, when, you, when you fast, you know, do all these things. People don't even know you're fasting. And he talks about, hey, when you give, you know, you ain't got to go out and tell everybody. He said, if you do, then you got your reward. So he, Matthew 6 goes on to talk about the good works. Yeah. And we come to Matthew 7. And it deals with judging. talks about, he deals with judging, he deals with judging, he says, hey, judge, talks about judging yourself before you judge others. He said, judge not that you be judged, and the measure that you extend it, it shall be extended unto you. And um, the conclusion of Sermon on Mount, it, it, he talks about false prophets. He talks about, you know them by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. And we've been giving some, 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 been hearing some great words around here. We've been hearing some great, powerful words that God has been sharing. And we have seen some of that stuff being manifested right before our eyes. We've been seeing that. Not only, we, we've been experiencing that. We've been experiencing it. And like the woman of God said today, hey, that's only a glimpse. 
that's only a glimpse of what God desires for you. It's only a glimpse. So Matthew 6, 24, this is what I want to start with. Again, we've been talking about um, staying focused, keeping the main thing the main thing, not getting distracted for what God has called you to do. We can't even get distracted by doing a good thing. A lot of times we can get caught up even doing a good thing. I gave you an illustration that we came from Luke 11. We talked about Martha and Mary. How when Jesus entered into their presence, Martha began to clean. Jesus is coming. She began to clean. She began to do all these things. Now, I'll be the first one to say, if Jesus was coming to my house, I would do the same thing. I'd get it spotless myself. But Martha got frustrated because as Jesus entered in, Mary went side at Jesus' feet. So Martha was doing all these things and she began to complain to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm doing all these things and Mary is just sitting right there doing nothing. Martha was doing a good thing just at the wrong time. So you can't even get busy doing a good thing. See, Mary understood what was the most important thing at that point in time, and that was being in the presence of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes. She understood that Jesus was the bread of life. Yes. At that point in time, at that moment, we talked about a moment earlier. Life is all about moments. And at that very moment, that's all that matters. At that moment, that's all that matters. So verse 24 says, No man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to his one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. We're going to talk about this one for a minute. We're going to talk about money for a minute. I think it's important because Jesus talked about money more than any other topic in the New Testament. Now that's shocking to some of you. But the kingdom of heaven and money, Jesus talked about more than any other topic in his ministry. Again, we know that mammon represents money, wealth, materialistic things, materialistic possessions. And I guarantee you right now, some of us, or all of us, all of us, know someone that has gotten drawn away by chasing mammon. may be guilty of it ourselves. I shared with you earlier how the man was on the, uh, on, uh, that I was, I was reading about said 99.9 .9 of the nine things of the things we pray about is money related. Now Jesus, now when Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray in Matthew 6, he says, he gave them the model prayer. He says, hey, this is how you pray. He says, hey, they pray about God's will be done, his kingdom come, his will be done. That's how Jesus said we should pray. Because money, houses, cars, provision, whatever you need, falls under that. Yeah. It's included. It's an all-inclusive deal if Jesus will, if God will is done in your life. It's all-inclusive. Yes. It's all-inclusive. It's all-inclusive. Everything that you need is all-inclusive. So he says, hey, just pray this. Pray like this. That's good. First Timothy 6 to 10 says, it says, for the love of money is the root of all 
kind of evil, not the root of all evil, but all kind of evil, because we know that the root of all evil is sin. He says that for the love of money is the root of all kind of evil. Now again, I want to make, now I don't want to get it twisted that there's nothing wrong with having money. Nothing wrong with having possessions. Nothing wrong with having wealth. It just can't have you. Amen. Nothing wrong with having it. It just can't have you. That's right. Because Jesus says where your, where, your, where your treasures is, what you treasure, that's where your heart is. Yes. Yes. Because out of the heart flows the, the trials of life. Out of your heart. So he says, hey, that can't be what you treasure because if you treasure that, then that becomes a part of you. It goes from your head to your heart. It goes from a thought that, that's in your head to your heart. So he goes on to talk about, we, we spoke on it earlier, that we don't have to Wish upon a star for a provision. Jeremiah 29 says like this. He says that, he says, God says, I know the plans that I have for you. His plans are to prosper you. God's plans are to prosper you and not to harm you. So we don't have to pray about those things. We just have to pray about it as, as Jesus was teaching his disciples in Matthew 6 that God's will be done in your life. Because his plans, his will is to prosper you. His will is to prosper you. His will is to prosper you. Yes, Because if we get distracted by chasing things, it'll get you our course. And once you get out there, it's hard to come back. Whatever you compromise to going up the mountain will control you when you get on top of the mountain. Whatever you compromise to going up the mountain, it will control you when you get on top of the mountain. So if you compromise to chasing the things going up the mountain, when you get on top of the mountain, you'll do whatever you can to maintain your position when you get on top of the mountain. Whatever it takes. You will do whatever it takes to maintain that. We see it all the time. People sell their souls, their family, whatever, to maintain the status. I, I don't I don't watch it much, but I, I can remember one of the first reality shows I watched. And I believe everyone I watch from, from then on, when the couples get on there, none of those couples are together now. Because they were chased, they was, it was all about money, it was all about status, it was all, all about trying to build themselves up. And they sold their soul, they sold themselves for the fame. So whatever you could compromise to going up the mountain, it'll control you at the top of the mountain. Yes. Now some of you may not have that, that issue. Some of you may not have that issue. So if you don't, for a minute, I want you to just think about man and somebody. Everybody has something that can easily distract them. Yeah. It may not be money. It could be car, the, the, the TV, whatever distracts you and take your focus off God has become your God. Um, yeah, that's good. Whatever hinders you and gets you off focus 
from 25, verse 25 says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. For He says, take no thoughts for your life. What you should eat or what you should drink, nor yet for your body, but what what you shall put on. It says, it's, it's not the life more than meat and the body that reigneth. So all throughout Matthew 6, um, here he is, God is says, focus on me. He says, take no thought for it. We just spoke earlier. Why did he say, take no thought for it? God said, don't worry about all those things. He says, I know the plans I have for you. My plans are to prosper you. God says, hey, focus on me. Cast all your cares upon me. I don't want you worried about nothing. Focus on me. I got you. Only thing I need you to do is get in place, worship me, be the salt and the light that I talk about. And I'll take care of everything else. Yes, I'm going to keep saying this. It was never God's intention for you to carry the weight of your provision. It was never God's intention. Never God's intention. Verse 26, it says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. It says, Are you not much better than they. Zechariah 2 and 8 says, God says, hey, he says, you're the apple of my eye. And real quickly, he says, you're the apple of my eye. You understand that what the apple of your eye means. It means it, it's, it's the pupil of your eye. It's the most important part of your eye. It's the part of your eye that it lets the light in, that lets the, that those light rays go back to the retina and somehow sends the, 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 uh, the message back to your brain where your brain forms the images. Because we see in pictures, we see in pictures, things enter our eyes as light, and our brain has to turn it into pictures. So we see in images. But one of here's what, but here's what I want to say to you. God, all through our scripture, God is saying, "You're the apple of my eye. You're the apple of my eye." We know that the apple, the eye, is the most important organ of your body. Yeah. Just like now, if I could pick up some of my throat at you, what the first thing you try to protect? You're going to put your hand over your face, try to protect your eyes. So that's what God is saying. He says, hey, you're my most prized possession. Yes, yes, Lord. You are my most prized possession. So God says, you're the, you're the apple of my eye. You're, you're my most prized possession. I, and I, wanna, I need to wrap this up right quick. But a verse 27 goes on to talk about um, what good is worried is gonna what good is worrying gonna do you? First, I want to skip down to verse 32. Verse 32 says, For all these things that do the Gentile seek. Now we know that the Gentile is the unsaved one, the one who haven't been adopted into the family of God. He says, For your heavenly father know what you have need of. He goes on to talk about um well, he said, I'm saying this, he said, I, I'm saying as believers, you have an a, a inheritance that will never perish. Yeah, yeah. Furthermore, yeah. Romans 8 says, hey, you are joint heirs with Christ. Yeah. You are joint heirs with Christ. Some of y'all didn't get that. But let me tell you what a joint heir with Christ gives you access to. Colossians 1 and 16 says this. It says that all things were created for him. For him. Somebody say for him. All things were created for him and by him. So if you are joint heirs with Christ, then you have all th those same things that was created for him and by him were created for you also. They were created for you as well. Last one. Verse 33 says this. It says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's commandment. That's an obedience. What do we, what, now, test. Test for y'all. I, I said all throughout scripture, behind, behind every act of obedience and commandment, what follows? Blessings. Blessings, blessings, blessings follow. It says, For seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God is saying, hey, listen, focus on me, 
Focus on the kingdom of God, which is his plan, his rule for your life. He says, hey, that's all you need to focus on. Yeah. That's it. And all, he says, not some things, but all these other things will be added unto you. All these things shall be added unto you. So God is saying, hey, listen, focus on me. God is trying to get us back to that place of the garden. God is trying to get us back to that place where Adam and Eve never had to carry the weight of their own provision. That's what God is trying to get us back to. But we got to stay focused on Him. We can't get caught, continue to get caught up with distractions, the cares of the world, life, consuming us, distractions, pulling on us. God is saying, come back to that place. Come back to that place. Focus on me. I got you. I don't want you to worry about provision. And under provision, whatever it is, you feel it in. You feel it in. Whatever you need, that's what provision is. God says, I don't want you to worry about that. All you got to do is focus on me. Focus on me. And all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Thank God for the day. Today was an amazing day. Um, since earlier that God really wanted to do something, we, 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 if you wasn't here when service first began, we normally started at 2, but we started at about 1.45, just setting the atmosphere, setting the atmosphere for what God did today. The type of atmosphere that God that was produced today, captives set free, salvation took place. Something mean that something that held you bondage had to let you go. Something that held you bondage, whatever it is, again, feel, you fill in the blank. Something that held you hostage, you were set free from today. So I just thank God for an amazing day and for what he did and what he's going to continue to do. Hold on to this word that you got. Hold on to it. Keep it before your eyes because the enemy... In John 10, 10, God tells us that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Destroy your dreams, destroy, destroy your hope, steal your faith. So take this word, hold on to it, eat on it, keep it before your eyes, and faint not. Because God got you. Amen.